Good morning, sunshine. Good morning. <laughs> what a wonderful experience already, yes? Yes. It really a delight. Today's lecture topic, merging of identities. I was caused to look and see how it is that we perceive ourselves to be and then how we then move with that, but not necessarily in a conscious way, in recognizing others. And usually what we do is we come away with a feeling of you're you, I'm me, and maybe there's a little bit of we, but there's a lot of difference. Perhaps it just takes experience, years growing, to where you begin to look again. And then you're looking again, you begin to consider maybe things are differently than the way I have habitually seen. Maybe I'm not who I believe I am. And maybe I. I'm looking at you and seeing you as a belief you when, geez, you may not see yourself that way at all. Sometimes I think it is that the perplexity of this helps to create an atmosphere of distance and anxiety. What is it or what is there to be found? that can help us in merging our identities. Well, if we look at differences, that doesn't work. So we have to look for similarities. One of the similarities can come about from differences and conflict of differences. The thing I'm making reference to now is restorative, <coughs> restorative justice. I don't know how many of you have heard of it or not, but it's been in operation for a number of years, and basically what it is is the, the offender is brought face to face with the victim of the crime. Just think for a moment now how challenging that would be for you if you were the victim and to be brought face to face with the offender and then also, from the other perspective, if you were the offender and be brought to face to face with the victim of what is called a crime. Okay, I'm, I'm using words in the normal context of usage. But look and see that what we're talking about here is relationship. Relationship that usually ends in a shut down, closed, result to where we feel isolated, alone, perhaps, and in that we are containing tremendous, powerful energies, often feelings of rage, bitterness, disappointment, anger, and then from perhaps an offender's perspective, an indifference. Of course, that is a shield. But to have these two people brought together can then begin to melt down the differences of identity to where the result is we begin to experience something called empathy. Think of yourself. Where are you with the relationship of empathy? Are you able to empathize with yourself? The parts of you that you don't like, you're not really happy with? Are you able to empathize with your own kind, other human beings? Do you have empathy toward nature, animals, plants, with other forms of life? Because you see, 
When I'm speaking of empathy, I'm speaking of the ability to feel with another. To identify with them and sense what they are experiencing. You could even take this to the point of saying, when we actually empathize with another, we make a, a psychic and emotional connection with that other. So that when we experience real empathy or compassion, our identities actually merge with the others. Instead of there being difference, there becomes some type of inner recognition of oneness. I and the other have a connection that I may not, I may not consciously see it as oneness, but I definitely feel it as something different than separateness. This is awakening. It's awakening on a very personal level, and usually in a very personal way. Any of you who have suffered grievances, either that have been brought to your table, so to speak, or that you have brought to another, you know what I'm speaking of. That you can put it off, you can deny it, you can go into all kinds of activities that you attempt to keep yourself from remembering, recalling, having be there in your awareness. But they, by God, come back. And it's a good thing that they do, because they're really there as teachers designed to get us to come to a place of addressing who we are, who we believe we are, what we have done, what it has actually caused to happen, and what we have done with the action ourselves when it has been placed upon us. Growth. Awakening. We're different. Men are different than women. I think it's pretty well recognized, I at least recognize it, that women have a lot more empathy than men. Have you ever noticed women when they talk together? Their talking go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a design, you see, because, well, women also are, are better at reading other people simply by looking at their eyes. Women's friendships, tend to be based on mutual help and problem solving or problem sharing. Their conversations, like I said, they can last longer, and it's because they, they, they use more back channel support, such as nodding, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, smiling, gestures, and then when they disagree, generally speaking, it is not a confrontational disagreement but rather they express their opinions indirectly. Sometimes that really feels good, you know, to have someone say, mm -hmm, you know, instead of, boy, that was really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and when I say that, I start to think now, because men, in their use of language, they use language in a very different way. If they disagree, they tend to express their opinion straightforward. And so far as talking, they will talk over you. And the object of this, if you look, you see that men spend more time using language to demonstrate their knowledge, their skills, and their status. The vast majority of man's inhumanity throughout history has really been man's. Almost all the wars have been orchestrated and fought by men, and most social oppression has been inflicted by high-status men seeking to protect and increase their power and wealth. 
It says something about our kind and the way that we are, we're raised, we're trained, we're brought up. That helps us to also look again and see, my God, we lack empathy for ourselves and for others. And when I speak of empathy, I also want to include compassion. And some of the ways that we can better bring this forward in our lives is by facing the things that we have been avoiding about ourselves, in ourselves, that we have lived, that we believe to be true about ourselves because of the way that we have lived them, and totally ignoring our true nature. We so heavily identify with who we have been, we project it into the future and say that is who I shall continue being. Fortunately, we have situations come up where instead of having to die, we go through the little death of facing our mistakes. Perhaps it's in the night. You wake up from a bad dream, and the bad dream causes you to say, wait a minute, what is this trying to say to me? And sometimes what it is is it's that one that we've stuffed down inside ourselves that's begging to come out, to be released. And in the release, then how are you going to, how are you going to handle it? Are you going to embrace it? Are you again going to deny it? Are you again going to say, no, that's it, I can't handle you? Well, if you come to a place of being one of empathy with yourself, then you begin to look and see, whoa. I need to forgive here. Instead of hanging on to that identification and having that inflicted self on who I am now, I need to come to a place of realizing that's who I was then and I took that action then because of who I believe myself to be then. The same can be true if it's somebody else that you're holding responsible for anything that has gone wrong in your life. Forgiveness is an amazing, powerful tool if it is genuinely lived. Because then you can come to a place of feeling a release occur. There's a freeing up soulfully, to where you then are able to be much more at ease being who you are. The same is true with regard to the application in your relationship to others, as I was making reference. Nature, animals, plants. Many, many tribal peoples live a very different relationship with nature than Western civilization people do. There's a Lakota chief by the name of Luther Standing Bear who said, animals have rights. The right of a man's protection. The right to live. The right to multiply. The right of freedom. And the right to man's indebtedness. And in the recognition of these rights, the Lakota never enslaved an animal and spared all life that was not needed for food and clothing. To a large extent, the environmental destruction that's taking place now in the world is a manifestation of our lack of empathy for nature. It's our lack of empathy for the earth. Our strongly developed ego means that we experience a sense of otherness to nature. We can't sense its aliveness. And so, consequently, we don't feel any qualms about exploiting or abusing it. Please, if you will, allow yourself to look and see where we are in relationship to life right now on our planet. We continue with a lack of empathy, and we're going to destroy everything, including ourselves. And it won't make a damn bit of difference who we point the finger at. 
It begins right here, right now, with you, in you, about you, and your relationship, me, in me, about me, and my relationship to all involved. The lack of empathy, obviously, as I have just brought out, makes cruelty and oppression possible. The presence of empathy heals conflict. The wider empathy stretches from victims to offenders, from one ethnic group to another, from nation to nation, from religion to religion, the less brutal and more harmonious a place the world will become. If you open yourself to it and allow the experience to flood your being, you're going to find that empathy is simply the experience of our true connectedness. The exchange of feeling through a channel of shared consciousness which unites not just human beings, but all living and non-living things. So for a moment, allow yourself to consider, open up to picturing how the world looks through other people's lives. Think how other people's predicaments make them feel and how their experiences mold their perceptions or how their perceptions create their experiences. Perhaps when you speak to others, you can try giving them your full attention. And perhaps before you condemn another for behaving badly, give consideration to the reasons for the behavior. In a very simple way, I had that opportunity this morning because they had four lanes shut down on the bridge, the Bay Bridge, coming over to the city. I got to experience a variety of human awarenesses. <laughs> and because I'm thankful for the lecture, it gave me the opportunity to consider, why don't I try empathy here? Why don't I, instead of just saying, you jerk, I open up and say, well, the reason you are a jerk is because of other possibilities that in all likelihood, you're not even consciously, remotely aware. Sometimes it is that we have to go beyond our own strongly developed egos and its rightness in all things when it doesn't know anything. We go to a place of opening up in this awakening process to tap into another part of us that gives us a better sense of who we are to where it is easier for us to be altruistic. It's easier for us to be kind to others. And while you're at it, I encourage you to make sure that your life contains an element of service where you put the needs of others before your own. The merging of identities. It is happening, but it isn't. How can I say this? It isn't something that's forced upon you. You may give yourself opportunities that look like they're forced opportunities, but it really is your higher self giving you what you need because of who you believe you are that no longer works in your benefit. Thank you for your attention.
more information about the Metaphysical Church of Enlightenment or the Rodin Foundation, please go to our website at www.rodin.org. If you have been inspired by the revelations shared in these podcasts, please donate to the Rodan Foundation's ongoing efforts to help others help themselves at www.rodan.org slash donate.